Good morning. Thank you all for this opportunity. So we're going to change directions a little bit. I think many of you are probably adult gastroenterologists, but obviously, regardless of what age patient you take care of, all of them were children once. So I hope that you all learn a lot from what we have to share with you. So our objectives for this morning are to learn about transition of care and its role in IBD and to recognize the differences between pediatric and adolescent and versus adult IBD. It's important to recognize that there are also a number of barriers and challenges for adolescents and young adults with IBD. And then I'm gonna share with you some of the approaches and resources that can facilitate and enable a successful transition process. So what is transition of care? Well, the first thing to know is that it is a process. It is not a step. It is a process of preparing an adolescent or young adult patient and his or her caregivers for the move to adult care. It is not simply the transfer from one provider to another. And it is built on education, communication, and thoughtful preparation. It fosters effective self-management and independence. So what's also important to consider is that as you take care of adults as a provider, it's a dyadic relationship. You're the provider, they're the patient, communication is a two-way street. However, in pediatrics and in care of the adolescent patient, we think of it as a triad with the patient, the parent, and the provider. It's important to take into consideration the shift in roles, the various social pressures on the teen and young adult patient, the developmental changes that are ongoing, any life issues that may be salient at this time, issues of confidentiality, a redefining of responsibility within the household, financial and insurance considerations, the role of increasing independence and autonomy in the patient, and the importance of a continuing a shared decision-making process. So the transition process actually really should start quite early with patients as young as 12 to 14 years old with the introduction of disease-based context and disease-based learning about what the diagnosis is, what medications are being uh, consumed. And then as we move into middle adolescence, you start to talk about the specifics of the transition and encourage the adolescent to take on more independence in managing his or her medications, calling in refills, and discussing when they are sick so that we're not playing a literal game of telephone where I'm on the phone with the doctor saying, how does Johnny feel today? And mom goes, how do you feel today? It can really inhibit really good communication. As they move into late adolescence and young adulthood, we should be packaging the medical information for transition with a complete medical summary, insurance maintenance, uh, maintaining insurance as they move to adult care, communicating directly with the patient and not the parents anymore, and communicating with the uh, provider who will be taking over their care. So transition, and who is it for? Well, I'd like to share four different cases with you and as we move through this talk, to think about how each of these cases has different needs around the transition process. So the first patient is really easy. This is the patient who's ready. This is an 18-year-old patient who was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at age 12. It was moderately active. She's now in remission. She's planning on going away for college. She wants more independence. She's completely on the ball. She takes her own uh, is in charge of her own refills, she takes care of her own medications, and both she and her parents are on the same page and she's ready to take over her care. This patient is really a dream patient for any provider regardless of their age. So we also see cases where we have a reluctant parent or, or guardian. In this case, we had a 19-year-old male with Crohn's colitis. It was diagnosed at the age of seven. He had a colectomy with an endiliostomy. He's been followed by the same pediatric provider since diagnosis, and his parents are really quite attached to this physician and are very, very involved in all aspects of care. They call when he's sick. They make all of his appointments. And although the patient reports that he manages his own meds and ostomy care, it's really not clear how much management he's doing on his own. 
We also might see reluctant physicians. Pediatric providers get very attached to their patients, and as we see them grow up, it's really hard to say goodbye. So this was an 18-year-old male patient who had severe stricturing iliocolonic Crohn's. He was initially very, very ill, multiple hospitalizations. He transferred his care to Dr. B, who diagnosed him with a missed stricture, and he underwent ileocecectomy at age nine. He's going away to college. And his parents and he both ask about transition and how he's going to have his care provided. But Dr. B expresses that she's quite worried about transitioning him to a new physician. Now, you can also imagine any of these patients, or this one in particular, where you have the same story, and the patient may also be experiencing significant cognitive challenges and social delays, and that may affect the transition process as well. And then we have this case four, the semi-independent young adult patient. So a 20-year-old female comes to clinic. She's got aggressive iliocolonic Crohn's that was diagnosed at age 15. She has a history of very intermittent care and non-adherence. She lives with her father but describes herself as independent, which you ascertain as perhaps a little bit more semi-independent. She has a part-time job. Dad makes the appointment but tells you in private he thinks she needs an escalation of her medical care and wants you to take charge. He tells you privately that he is aware she, he thinks that she will likely need surgery. After that appointment, at the end of the appointment, she says she's willing to follow your recommendations but does not come back for clinic as recommended, is not taking her medications, and has not done the labs and imaging you ordered. And this is a typical patient that you might see in your adult clinics as well. So before you understand what the transition process it is, you must understand where these patients are coming from and a little bit more about pediatric IBD. So out of the 1.4 million cases of inflammatory bowel disease in the United States, about 20 to 25% are children and adolescents. We see a slight increase in males with Crohn's disease versus females and more or less equivalent rates in our ulcerative colitis patients. The prevalence of, of IBD in patients less than 20 is 43 per 100,000 in Crohn's and 28 per 100,000 with ulcerative colitis. What's important to highlight here is that the peak age of diagnosis in children and young adults is adolescence in patients 15 to 20 years. Just when they're supposed to be gaining their independence and autonomy, they're getting diagnosed with IBD, making the process all the more difficult. And this slide just highlights it very nicely with a peak in both Crohn's and UC at 15 to 20. It's also important to remember that children are not just small adults. And as shown by this very nice study by Van Limbergen et al., he compared pediatric onset Crohn's and colitis with adult onset. So he looked at roughly 400 pediatric patients. And as you can see, ulcerative colitis was much more likely to be extensive in pediatric onset disease. Crohn's disease was also much more likely to be extensive with both iliocolonic and upper GI tract involvement, 43% versus 3%. The need for surgery was much higher in our pediatric patients who had ulcerative colitis at 10 years, and surgery rates were slightly higher in the adults for, with Crohn's. And as you can see, we see pretty impressive rates with, of progression with stricturing disease with 4.4% at diagnosis, almost 10% by two years, and 11.4% at four years. So these can be quite sick patients with quite extensive disease. So remember, the care of the adult patient who had pediatric onset disease may differ. We also have nice evidence that older adolescents, those 18 to 20 years old, may have a more pediatric phenotype than the adults 33 to 56 years old. And in this really wonderful study by Goodhand et al., they compared the phenotype in these two groups. And as you can see, the adolescents had much higher rates of Crohn's disease, much more likely to have iliocolonic involvement at 69% far more likely to have upper GI tract Crohn's, which is really important when you think about your diagnostic and surveillance colonoscopies and endoscopies. These patients may or be much more likely to need an EGD as well. We did see more ulcerative colitis in our adult patients, but higher rates of pancolitis in those older adolescent groups. We also saw very high rates of inflammatory phenotype and perianal disease. We also know when we look at the medications and hospitalizations and surgeries in this group that adolescents have more severe disease. 
we see that they have higher rates of thiopurine use, 46%, higher rates of infliximab use, 46% were hospitalized compared to just 14% in the adult population, and 18% required surgery. This is all compounded by the fact that they may not come to their clinic appointments and had a 20% rate of missed appointments compared to their adult counterparts. So these pop this population really needs specialized care. It's also important to note that IBD negatively impacts school performance and children with IBD have poor school functioning with significant increases in absences compared to healthy controls and decreased GPAs. Predictors of worse educational outcomes in this population include lower socioeconomic status, comorbid mental health conditions, and thankfully we did not see any correlation with the age of diagnosis, the IBD type steroids or hospitalization. But it's important to remember, IBD can impact where, when, or if a teen can go to college or get a job. It's also important to remember that teens are likely to engage in more high-risk behaviors. And this very nice study comparing healthy teens to those with any type of chronic illness found that teens with chronic disease are more likely to engage in high-risk health behaviors. So this group compared about 760 patients with chronic diseases to over 1,000 uh, healthy controls. And they found that they were more likely to engage in smoking alcohol misuse, cannabis or illegal drug use, early sexual intercourse, eating disorders, and violent and social acts. They also found that these teens were with chronic diseases were likely to engage in multiple high-risk behaviors. We don't know the specifics for patients with IBD, but our group is starting to look at this data right now. So why is transition of care important in IBD? Well, we know that up to one third and one quarter, uh, one third of parents and one quarter of teens are apprehensive about leaving their pediatric providers and transitioning to an adult provider. We also know that youth with IBD have a decreased health-related quality of life, and that adolescents, as I've highlighted, are particularly vulnerable to psychological stress and are at a risk for reduced health-related quality of life. We also know that this health-related quality of life is a vital aspect of patient care, patient-physician communication, and shared decision-making. And we know from studying other chronic diseases that well-planned and coordinated transition to adult care improves outcomes in patients. So what are some of the challenges specific to this transition process? Well, we need to reconcile or manage the differences between pediatric and adult care that may include differences in management styles or therapies that are available or offered, all of those fantastic therapies that Russ just described. Many of those are not available to our pediatric patients, and that may be a factor in transition time and planning. There's differences in time allotted for visits, differences in procedure frequency and availability, as well as sedation, and differences in the pediatric and adult hospitals, as well as clinic setting. We also know that there are the significant psychosocial factors of adolescence, and teaching disease knowledge and self-management is a key aspect of pediatric IBD care. We also need to plan for the transition to independent living or college, and we need to think about how to package that medical history so that the adult providers really have a handle on what's been going on with this patient for all of these years. There are a few unique aspects of transition management in teens with IBD, and it's important to remember that acquiring disease management skills during a compressed time, because many of them are quite ill at the time of diagnosis, as we've talked about, these kids are most likely to get diagnosed between 15 and 20, and this may be the time that they're really starting to try to work towards their independence. We also need to consider the fact that they're managing a socially embarrassing condition when at a time when peer relations are already quite difficult, and that they're also working on seeking increased autonomy in non-illness related domains such as keys to the car, or curfew, all of these things, while at the time they still may need a lot of help around their IBD specific disease management. So are teens ready to be for transition? So this was a study that really questioned how providers felt on the adult side when they uh, 
were receiving these patients who had been on pediatric care. So they surveyed 363 adult providers and asked them how well prepared were the teens and young adults when they started clinic. And as you can see, the rates really quite vary, but none of them felt that the teens had a really good knowledge of their me medications, a good knowledge of their disease, None, only about half got a medical summary. Many of them didn't understand the role of drugs and alcohol. Few of them understood the impact of IBD, didn't know how to contact their provider, and many were still struggling with prescriptions. And that was the adult perspective once they had already transferred. So Lori Fishman in Boston uh, looked at 40 of her mid-range adolescent patients aged 16 to 18 years old and wanted to know how well versed they are in their IBD-based knowledge. And she found surprisingly good rates that almost 100% knew their diagnosis, as we would hope, and about 80 to 90% understood the disease, almost 100% knew their medications, and many, many knew their doses, which was quite reassuring. However, when she asked how ready they were to be independent in their self-management tasks, you can see the red bar is ulcerative colitis, the blue bar is Crohn's. On the left, we see parents only. That means the parents are the primary individual responsible for these self-management tasks. And number five is when the patient's doing it on alone. None of these teens and young adolescent patients were independent in any of their self-management tasks, calling in refills, remembering to take their meds, getting to the appointment, talking during to the appointment. So although they may want independence, they may still need a lot of support. We were also really interested in this question in our own transition clinic, and working with our collaborator, Rachel Greenlee, looked at our transition patients and asked how independent they were. So one was a score of one meant that they were not responsible for their own self-management tasks, and 10 was that they were fully responsible. Teens in our clinic said that they were overall quite um, independent in managing their own health care with a score of seven. However, when you looked at how many healthcare behaviors they did independently, you can see all these scores in red were less than four. They didn't call in their own refills, they didn't take their medications, they didn't make their own appointments, and they knew nothing about their health insurance. They also reported a high levels of involvement for their parents in these tasks. I'd also like to point out that we do need to help get these teens and young adults ready, and this was a group of 75 patients, and we queried how much they knew about their IBD and various IBD-related questions. And what we found was that although many knew what type of IBD he had, and thankfully 90% knew our names, many still didn't know the names of their medications. Only 64% knew what signs they had when they were flaring up. Half of them didn't know when their medications were supposed to be refilled. And only 20% knew the effects of drugs and alcohol. And only 20% knew how to call us to make an appointment or who to call when they were sick. So really, we have a lot of work to do. So transition and IBD, how do we ensure success of this vulnerable population? Well, the key is a really strong transition team. You need to have your pediatric providers and adult providers or your med peds providers working together to ensure success. You need GI nurses, APNs, and wound ostomy incontinence nurses as well pediatric and adult surgeons, dietitians, and partnership between these teams is critical. You can't do this alone. There are also a number of fantastic tools that are now available to help. There's medical summary apps, health passports, app trackers, symptom trackers, auto pharmacy refills, transition assessments, and nobody's really evaluated or compared them among groups, but I just wanted to share a few of my favorites that I find are very helpful. So they're listed here, I apologize. That's a fantastic book by Lori Fishman. Um, are your pediatric patients ready for transition care? This will be available in the slide set for you all. These are two of my favorite apps for self-management and care of patients with IBD, and I really encourage all of my patients to download them during their clinic visits, and I advise them that they're free and they don't have to use them when they're feeling well, but when they're not feeling well, having a symptom tracker can be really helpful for these patients. There are also some fantastic apps that have been put out by some of the major pharmacies that all they have to do is scan the barcode to get their refills. These are, again, apps I highly encourage my patients, regardless of their age, to use. So some tips for successful transition. It's important to cultivate relationships between adult and pediatric providers. 
We need to ask our patients about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? We need to talk about medication, adherence, depression, and risk behaviors. We need to recognize that teens and young adults may underreport their symptoms. So although in medical school we're taught to ask open-ended questions, if you don't get an ask a specific question or a direct question, you may get a fine or a more or less. How are you feeling today? More or less fine. Which one is it, more or less? You need to establish expectations for these patients to take on increasing responsibility. Oops. And a few more tips for successful transition. We need to cult oops. Oh, and we need to provide written, excuse me, we need to provide written instructions for visits, including diagnoses, medications, nurse and on-call numbers, date for next appointment, links and resources for self-management apps. So just a couple of take-home points. Inflammatory bowel disease in children and adolescents is different than it is in adults. Transition is a process. Teens want independence but struggle with disease knowledge and self-management skills. Education and good communication are critical and transition tools can be helpful. And partnership between the adult and pediatric providers and with the families and patients is critical and help, can help promote successful transition. And I'd like to thank everybody, in particular our transition team at the University of Chicago and my research collaborators.